martial arts. Prior to the 1950s, they seemed mysterious and so foreign to Americans. Only judo, with its tossing and tumbling, could claim a following outside Japan. The other disciplines were virtually unknown. Today, the martial arts have millions of devoted practitioners. Our fascination? Perhaps rooted in a primal instinct for self-preservation, survival. Yet the martial arts speak to human needs beyond the physical, mental discipline, spiritual serenity. Students follow time-honored traditions, testament to ancient warriors and holy men whose fighting arts played crucial roles in history. The ancient martial arts were fighting arts, with weapons or without. Their roots were life and death. The earliest martial arts started right along with the development of language, very crude, simple methods that were developed by ancient people, mainly for protection against animals and other people. They developed out of what was uh, at hand, for example, the sticks and stones that were laying around, or just the, the human body itself, the fist or the feet. <laughs> The precise origins of more sophisticated martial arts systems have been lost to time. Most evidence stems from ancient depictions in sculptures and paintings, leading some to believe that Africa is the birthplace of the martial arts. In the early 1800s, in an area called Beni Hassan, along the lower Nile in Egypt, illustrations on tomb walls, now thought to be indicative of a martial arts system, were discovered. Their date of origin is estimated at 2500 BC, centuries before the existence of any other verifiable martial arts system. We're talking about everything from empty hand combat all the way up to use of weaponry. From the 500 individual pairs of wrestling figures to infantrymen with bows and arrows, to fighters with clubs and axes and maces, to the technology of the testudo, which is a shielding device, and their use of a long-range lance, right up to the fortification. We're looking at a complete martial arts system in every sense of the word. But it was the marriage of physical combat with a philosophical system that distinguished the martial arts of Asia. Most martial arts practiced around the world today have come mainly from China, Korea, Japan, and Okinawa. in Asia did different styles of empty-handed combat become an art regarded as a state secret or harbored within the walls of religious monasteries. Legend has it that in the early 6th century, Bodhidharma, an Indian monk and Buddhist missionary, began a long trek from Western India to China. There he would preach Buddhist doctrine. Ultimately, his journey took him to the remote Shaolin Temple in central China. The Shaolin Temple was founded in 495 AD in the Wen Dynasty, and Bodhidharma came to the temple in 527 AD. He taught many things at Shaolin, Buddhism, philosophy, meditation. Bodhidharma taught the Shaolin monks meditative breathing and stretching exercises like these that the monks named 18 Hands of the Lohan, or exercises for the greatest holiness. Some say this was a seminal influence into creating a Chinese martial art Others disagree.
Some Chinese scholars say that Chinese martial arts antedates the Shaolin Temple, that they were practiced in China hundreds of years, even thousands of years before this, and that um, this is just one aspect of Chinese martial arts. According to legend, the monks developed their exercise routine into a martial arts form that allowed them to defend themselves and their mountain temple against bandits and warlords. The monks' exercises would come to be known as Shaolin Boxing, or Chuang Ba, Way of the Fist and later in the West as Kung Fu. Shaolin Kung Fu spread across China and would eventually encompass hundreds of styles. Shaolin is like a, a, a big tree. It, uh, it had many branches that offshoot from the trees and uh, there were many different styles. Some were based on animal movements and emphasized the quick, aggressive attack method of the Chinese boxing school known as external or hard. Centuries later, Kung Fu would greatly impact the development of Karate. In 2nd century Korea, the Supreme Buddhist monk Wong Kwang Bopsa created a strict philosophical and moral code. Along with intellectual pursuits and martial arts, the code was taught to the sons and nobles in the kingdom of Shila, one of three ancient Korean provinces. They are what we still abide by today, the Hwarang Ogye. Um, loyalty to country, filial piety, uh, trust in brotherhood among friends, never retreating in the face of the enemy, and uh, mercy in killing, discriminating killing, never take a life without a cause. Upon completing his schooling, a young adult male in Shila received the title Waram, or Flowering Man. It can be read as a person coming, blossoming into maturity, or because he was Buddhist-influenced, attaining enlightenment. The 6th century Huarang fought and succeeded in uniting for the first time ever ancient Korea's three provinces. The art of the Huarang, called Huarangdo, was a result of the monk Bopsa, blending hard linear techniques and soft circular movements. Huarangdo would become an important predecessor to modern-day Taekwondo, Korea's national martial art. Most of Japan's ancient martial arts were established with or developed from a samurai tradition beginning in the 9th century. A samurai, one who serves, was born into the samurai class and trained from an early age to become a warrior. By the 15th century, the samurai's duty was to carry out the fighting orders of a feudal lord to whom he had pledged loyalty. One domain was trying to take over the other domain and through alliances and through betrayal and fighting they, uh, uh, they were all vying with each other. Bushido, a code of ethics similar to that of the Huarang warriors was formulated to help the samurai become perfect warriors. They studied bujutsu or military arts. These included the use of the spear and the bow and arrow as well as horsemanship. The true symbol of the samurai though was his sword. The sword was considered as the soul of the samurai, so that was his most important weapon. That was the weapon that uh, he carried by his side uh, at all times, and actually that was a weapon that he wore that symbolized his status as a samurai. Kinjutsu is a general term for all samurai swordsmanship. Iaijutsu was the art of drawing the sword. The idea was to 
draw and cut and dispatch your opponent in one movement. It was said that uh, by using one hand, you gain the advantage of uh, one inch over your opponent. And I guess that made a difference in these life and death duels. A samurai engaged in mortal combat with viciousness and efficiency. For these warriors, facing death on the battlefield, Chang, or Zen doctrine, carried enormous influence. The direct and immediate approach of the Zen Buddhist philosophy, don't think, just do, and its concept of the enlightened man as indifferent to life and death had great appeal for these warriors. During the feudal period's intense fighting, many samurai who fought losing battles were cast out from their noble ranks and sought refuge in mountain areas. Under pressure from government forces that would destroy them, these warriors perfected secretive martial arts techniques and developed special weapons to become the world's first practitioners of guerrilla warfare. Ninjutsu is the art of stealth, and the ninja were feudal spies. What they were well known for was having a network of people so they knew what was going on, when, where, they could use this information then to set up uh, systems to protect their communities when other invading troops were making the plans to invade. The idea was to be able to go in somewhere invisibly, know what was going on, and then move away. So maybe like a modern James Bond story where a person would disguise themselves as a cleaner-upper or disguise themselves as a mail deliverer or disguise themselves as a caterer, whatever it would take to go into an area that would otherwise be guarded, get the information and come out. The ninja became legendary. The ruses in which they dealt led common people to fear them and hold them in awe. In 1372, Okinawa, the largest island in the Ryukyu archipelago, was formally recognized by China. Later, as a gift, Okinawa received a permanent colony of Chinese craft people and their families, including Buddhist monks and others skilled in Chinese martial arts. They began teaching the Okinawans. The result was the creation of an Okinawan style of martial art influenced by Chuan Fa, the Chinese way of the fist. It would be called Te, or hand. In 1609, Japan's fierce Satsuma samurai clan began a battle to conquer Okinawa. The island kingdom was defeated, and all Okinawan weapons were confiscated and outlawed. The natives, for their own protection, were forced to improvise methods of weaponry using simple farming implements such as sickles, staffs, and millstone handles. This was called kobujutsu, art of weapons. The Okinawans also began to develop a hidden culture of empty hand fighting weapons. They had to practice secretly because if they had been found out, they would have been executed. So they would practice on the beaches, in the mountains, in the forests, and that has become a tradition also in martial arts. Te, a new form of fighting, would evolve into several styles. By the 18th century, the art characterized by quick darting movements and hard, sharp, linear punching. Please, please. Would be known as empty hand or karate. By the mid 19th century, the Asian martial arts were about to be discovered far outside their homelands. In the mid-1800s, thousands of Chinese laborers migrated to the United States for work in the mining camps and on the Central Pacific Railroad. 
with that mass immigration came the secret use of kung fu because it was still uh, maintained only by families and not taught to outsiders. There were people skilled in kung fu that trained in the work camps at night, oblivious to everyone else. In Japan, a new era had begun to dawn as the feudal system ceased to exist. By 1868, the samurai warrior class was officially dissolved and the ninja services became obsolete. Bujutsu, the warrior's military system of fighting and killing on the battlefield, fell into disuse. The warrior had to fit into a peaceful society, but yet the weapons and their use was a symbol of uh, they were symbols of his rank and position and status and as his inheritance from his ancestors they simply couldn't be discarded because they were no longer useful so the training was maintained gradually a spiritually related system Budo, the way of fighting became increasingly prominent it put self-development before the practical application of techniques. In the modern era, for example, Kinjutsu, art of the sword, would become Kendo, way of the sword. The term Do means path or way. Do has uh, the positive meaning of your training in your own martial arts discipline to not only become skillful in the art and become strong enough to defeat your opponent, but also to become a better person physically and spiritually and to develop oneself as a complete enlightened person. In 1882, Jigoro Kano synthesized Jiu-Jitsu art of gentleness into Judo, way of gentleness or flexibility. For Kano, techniques of throwing and grappling would lead to the perfection of mind and body, which in turn would lead to developing qualities of respect and courtesy. He was an educator. He was also a physical educator interested in developing the body and developing the person through the physical uh, realm. Judo would become one of the first Budos to combine self-development with a competitive element, making it one of the first martial sports. Jigoro Kano knew that he could get far more participation by the masses in it if it was a credible sport, which it was. To give his Judo practitioners training goals, Jigoro Kano developed a unique ranking system involving colored belts. The system rated students in terms of class, or kyo, and grade, or done. So you went through steps, going from white belt to brown belt to black belt. Those steps in the old days took years. So to become a black belt was not an easy thing. It was like uh, almost a lifetime commitment. Virtually all Budo systems developing in the late 19th and early 20th century would adopt this rank structure. In 1922, Ichin Funakoshi, an Okinawan school teacher and karate expert, was invited to Tokyo by the Japanese Ministry of Education to give a demonstration. It proved to be a momentous occasion. Before his era, every martial arts practicing was uh, secret. They cross and they don't teach to anybody else. But must take all this um, fence out and anybody can jump in, anybody can practice, somebody, somebody get better, it's good, everybody learn from them. Eventually, Funakoshi began teaching his style of karate called Shotokan in the Tokyo universities where he built a large student following. And as a school teacher, he had a basic understanding of philosophy and a higher plane of intellect rather than just teaching fighting techniques like most of the Okinawans did at that time. Books or written records on karate were non-existent until the 1920s when Funakoshi, the father of modern karate, began to write them. He discussed technique and philosophy in Karate Do Kyohan, later translated into English by one of Funakoshi's last direct students, Stomu Oshima. Those who follow Karate Do will develop courage and fortitude. One who truly trains in this Do 
and actually understands karate do is never easily drawn into a fight. One attack or a single kick determines life or death. Karate is properly applied only in those rare situations in which one really must either down another or be downed by him. Thanks to Gichin Nagoshi, karate, one secret, was open to the world. <laughs> Jiu-Jitsu was introduced to Brazil in the early 1900s by a Japanese fighter, Desai Maeda. My grandfather was a politician, helped the Japanese gentleman get established in Brazil, and then to show his gratitude, he started teaching the traditional Jiu-Jitsu to my uncle Carlos. In the mid-1920s, Carlos Gracie opened the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Academy in Rio de Janeiro. But it was his brother Elio would one day be honored as Brazil's first national sports hero for his achievements in jiu-jitsu. My father, I feel, improved jiu-jitsu in a sense that when he watched my uncle Carlos teach classes, and my uncle was using the traditional jiu-jitsu from Japan, those techniques were not so easy to apply that would require absolutely no strength. So what he needed to do is to, you know, improve those moves so they could be executed by a small man like him. The Gracie Academy quickly became a training and proving ground for self-defense techniques used by the country's army. Elio Gracie passed on the martial art he crafted to his children, who would one day carry on the Gracie tradition in America. The campaign to win Okinawa, vital as at least within fighter range of Japan, soon develops into a desperate and prolonged struggle. During World War II, Allied bombing of Okinawa began in March 1945. Not long afterward, Allied forces proved victorious. One result of the U.S. occupation was the so-called Scat Ban, issued by General Douglas MacArthur. He prohibited all martial arts training, and so once again, practitioners were forced to meet in secret. In 1947, the ban was lifted, and suddenly, Many of the servicemen stationed in Okinawa and Japan began studying the martial arts, a practice they considered exotic. Karate at that time was called the Ballet of Death. Uh, and we got interested because you see uh, these little Japanese jumping around the air, breaking boards, and, uh, phenomenal feats that we were not used to. As Americans, we're used to standing on our feet and, and fist fighting. Well, uh, they did it different, and it was very interesting. In 1946 in Phoenix, Arizona, Robert Trias, a former sailor, opened the first U.S. dojo, the Japanese term for a martial arts training hall. As World War II era servicemen returned to the U.S., they opened additional dojos. There, for the first time, many Americans were introduced to the martial arts. By the early 1950s, the armed services finally began to recognize the value of martial arts training. American airmen in Japan taking a flyer at judo. The ancient and honorable oriental art of self-defense is top priority for birdmen of the Strategic Air Command. Believing that martial arts expertise would help their survival behind enemy lines, General Curtis LeMay sent SAC pilots to Japan for instruction. Later in the 1950s, Tsutomu Oshima was authorized to teach karate outside Japan by Master Funakoshi. He began to give demonstrations in Los Angeles, but the public remained relatively uninterested. American people thought these uh, martial arts uh, people are crazy or abnormal people, I mean, or mental cases. But, but uh, they find out um, quite normal, uh, good human being jump into these kind of things and they train for a long time. After 1950s, people just started to take it as uh, some kind of serious business. Indeed, by the 1960s, the martial arts would undergo a renaissance as Americans began to train in earnest. On a &E.
In the United States, the 1960s and 70s were a period of explosive growth for the martial arts. Americans in increasing numbers began training. Perhaps bolstered by the liberation movement of the 1960s or by the desire to learn self-defense techniques, many women joined karate classes for the first time. In early 60s, something changed in the world. Many young ladies jump into the uh, martial arts and, uh, well, first reaction, all men tried to eliminate them, push them back but they stay there. Then I start to realize this is not a matter of male and female, and big and small, it's a matter of mental strength, mental levels. It teaches you to strike very, very hard, where before women um, obviously are, are taught never to hit, but if you need to, if you're cornered, if you're attacked, by all means, yes. In 1964, a decades-old dream of Judo's founder, Jigoro Kano, became reality. Judo was an official Olympic sport in the Tokyo Games. It made it a worldwide sport. It brought together some pride for a sport that probably in the United States is considered as a minor sport. The first ever U.S. Olympic Judo team was a cross-section of America. Paul Maruyama, then Night Horse Campbell who would later become a U.S. Senator, George Harris, and Jim Bregman, the competition's middleweight bronze medalist. We were very proud of him. Uh, he did an excellent job. Uh, it was just phenomenal, his activities. He did a, what is called an uchimata, which is a inside leg throw, and then switched very quickly without the other person being ready, and just threw the other person right over on his back, just within a split second. And Jim Beckman gets the bronze medal for the United States. Sport karate in the U.S. emerged in the early 60s along with the first large-scale national caliber karate competitions. During these seminal bouts, Karate's first American superstars emerged. They included Joe Lewis, Mike Stone, and Chuck Norris. Norris, a former U.S. airman from Oklahoma, had studied Tang Soo Do, Korean karate in Korea. He won every major title in karate between 1965 and 1970. He trained real hard. He went through a dog-eat-dog, dog, get down, get witted in the trenches kind of a workout and never said, I'm tired. I like that about Chuck. He could kick well and punch well. Up until that time, the Korean stylists were good kickers, they couldn't punch. The Japanese stylists were good punchers, but they couldn't kick. And Chuck was the first guy to come along to do both. From the mid to late 60s, American martial arts gained strength as karate instructors such as Ed Parker began to build personal followers. In Los Angeles, Parker taught a style of karate called Kimpo. Soon, American names such as Elvis Presley's started to become synonymous with karate. In 1964, Ed Parker staged the International Karate Championships in Long Beach, California. Assembled were some of the biggest names in American karate. But every competitor's accomplishments were overshadowed by a demonstration given by an unknown Chinese stylist named Bruce Lee. Lee was a sensation. The performance of his own version of Kung Fu left a lasting impression on many spectators and practitioners. I was so impressed with him. Even though he was five years younger than me, I thought he would be the person I would love to study under. And he needed a training partner because he was doing a series of uh, Gong Fu demonstrations and cha-cha dancing routines. 
and he needed someone to be his dummy. So he asked uh, if I would be the dummy and in exchange he would teach me. In the mid 60s, Bruce Lee had begun to develop a martial arts system. It combined Kung Fu with a variety of Eastern and Western fighting techniques, including boxing. Lee called it Jeet Kune Do, way of the intercepting fist. Lee meant for practitioners of the system to use all ways and means to serve an end. He said that an individual is probably more important than any established style, whether it be Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Okinawan. So you've got to find out what works for you, and that's not necessarily dictated by a culture. I think he made people aware that uh, there's something good to be found in, in every martial art. Almost single-handed. Lee launched a martial arts craze beginning in the late 1960s with his American acting debut as Kato, a martial arts crime fighter in the Green Hornet TV series. Many uh, adults to this day can remember their first interest in martial arts through that particular TV series, the Green Hornet or Kato. Motion pictures tied to the fighting styles of Kung Fu have become enormously popular around the world. And one of the major factors in this success has been Bruce Lee master of the art of self-defense. During the decade of the 1970s, Bruce Lee helped establish an unprecedented mass acceptance of the martial arts in America that has never been matched. In Hong Kong, the greatest kung fu fighters in the world are keeping alert under the intense physical strain. There is no other way to make a motion picture called Enter the Dragon. With Enter the Dragon, Bruce Lee mania became a worldwide phenomenon. Lee played a Shaolin disciple motivated to destroy a drug operation. When the movie was released a short time after Lee's death in 1973, it became a huge hit. Action! This was kind of an eclectic style. And I think all of these things that he used just simply made it more interesting. It really made him famous, and I think it uh, was the catalyst that made America, you know, kung fu crazy. <laughs> we had more millions of people involved in martial arts because of Bruce Lee than any other single figure. The crowd, very excited here at the Olympic Auditorium, full contact for us. The martial arts boom of the 70s continued to be fueled by the film and television media. Oh, oh, oh. In 1972, the television series Kung Fu starred David Carradine and brought martial arts into American living rooms on a weekly basis. Then, film goers in the early 1970s cheered a character named Billy Jack. A Vietnam War veteran and karate expert, Billy Jack took on the reactionary establishment. Star Tom Laughlin's kicks, choreographed by martial artist Bong Su Han, introduced audiences to a Korean martial art called Hapkido. When they first released Billy Jack picture, I went to theater to watch audience reaction was incredible. The woo walled everywhere. Yeah! Just simply because never seen any kicking like this in movie history. I was very pleased with that reactions. By the early 80s, the numbers of students training in schools across the country had leveled off. That changed, however, in 1984 when the Karate Kid came along. Ralph Macho betrayed a teenager tormented by bullets until an unlikely mentor, a handyman, played by Pat Morita, teaches him about self-confidence and karate. Karate here. Karate here. Karate never here. You understand? I think so. In the 70s, the film star was flying through the air and doing superhuman antics and fighting for 20 minutes and all this insanity. 
And Karate Kid changed all of that. In many ways, the Karate Kid restored the dignity of the martial artist. He restored the dignity of the instructor, and that was through the brilliant portrayal of Mr. Miyagi. A lesson not just karate only. A lesson for all life. He took us from being superhumans to being caring, compassionate instructors. That clicked, particularly with parents throughout the country, and that's when we saw a huge influx of children in the schools. In 1988, hundreds of Korean martial artists demonstrated Taekwondo at the Olympic Games in Seoul. Millions of Americans, many for the first time, got a good look at Korea's national sport and loved it. From the 88 Olympics, we saw a great uh, influx of Taekwondo studios around the country. And you probably see more Taekwondo now than anything else. And so it, it's really taken off, and I think the Olympics had a lot to do with that. The martial arts have come a long way since their secretive practice by a select few. And the contributions to the martial arts by Americans have been enormous. The Americans, by far, have pioneered everything that's been important in terms of, of economic growth and in terms of commercialism. Americans have actually made the martial arts a worldwide entity. The martial arts will return on A&E. There are hundreds of martial arts, and within each are several styles. Many arts and styles share common techniques. Some are primarily hard, focusing on the kicking and striking. Others are soft, emphasizing throws, locks, and grappling. No one art can be considered the best, but among the martial arts of China, Korea, Japan, and Okinawa, there are about a dozen arts which have grown increasingly popular in the U.S. and throughout the world. Many believe that the heart of all Eastern martial arts is the ancient Chinese art of Kung Fu. In China today, Kung Fu training often begins at an early age. In fact, it's an integral part of the curriculum at some schools, such as the Tago Wushu, or Martial Arts Institute in central China. Here, some 4,000 students practice Kung Fu daily. China, the term Kung Fu refers to a person skilled in any field. Most Westerners, though, associate Kung Fu specifically with fighting techniques, some of which are adapted from nature. There are even some specific styles of Kung Fu that just deal with animals such as the mantis movements, which concentrate on how mantises capture their prey. and monkey movements, which use the actions of monkeys to design several fighting movements. As Kung Fu spread throughout China, it began to reflect the physical characteristics of its practitioners and their surroundings. In northern part of China, the people usually are taller, so they have longer legs, so they utilize the leg more, and then the land is more flat, so they can do more leaping and jumping. Southern part of China, the land and landscaping is not as uh, flat. They have uh, a lot of rocky mountain area, and people live in the area usually are shorter, so therefore they will stay on the ground more, so they use more hand than rather high jump and kick. Since ancient times, the use of weapons has been a part of Kung Fu. 
Students from around the world study weaponry and other kung fu techniques at the International Shaolin Training Institute in central China. There are several legends concerning the origin of Tai Chi Chuan. But historical evidence points to a location in central China known as Chen Jiago, Chen Village, as Tai Chi's 17th century birthplace. While Tai Chi Chuan is practiced mainly for exercise, originally it was a fighting art. The transition from one movement to the next movement, every movement is a fighting application. It was used in warfare. Practicing Tai Chi Chuan can affect one's vital energy or qi. There are several styles, all based on the solo form, which is a series of deflections and counters against an imaginary attacker. When the solo forms are perfected, a student goes on to one of the highest levels of exercise called push hands. What it is is a sensitivity to the partner's uh, energy. If we become that high level, we can actually perceive what the partner is going to do and we almost can know what the person is going to do before he even does it. Even at its most basic level, Tai Chi Chuan can improve muscle tone, circulation, and ultimately some say one's inner peace. Today, millions practice Tai Chi boxing for holistic health purposes. They discovered that Tai Chi actually does a lot of good for the human nervous system, the digestive system and the circulatory system. It actually exercises these three parts of the body. In Korea, Warangdo evolved from the fighting techniques of the 6th century Warang warriors. Legend has it they could kill with a single punch. They were also known to spin kick so fast it was as if their feet were swords. Warangdo uses circular and linear movements derived from ancient times. Training is divided into four parts. Negong which means internal power, developing internal energy, which we call qi. Chinese, it's qi. And wei gong, which is external power. That means utilizing our physical body for self-defense. Then uh, xin gong, which is developing our mental capacity. And wu gi gong, which is weapon power. Warangdo is one of the most complex martial arts systems. Guigong, or external power, comprises over 4,000 offensive and defensive techniques, including pressure point applications. Other martial arts, they are continuous spotting and fighting and this. But Warangdo, only one movement, finish the opponents, make a surrender. Apkido evolved from Warangdo in 1945. It's a style of self-defense designed to defeat attackers with strikes, throws, or lightning fast circular kicks. Apkido's signature kick is a spinning heel. As you spin, automatically it adds a speed. It's circular movement. So without losing your balance, you develop so much power into the target. Nothing can stop them. Apikido is a way of coordinated power. The foundation of Apikido is the water principle. During a fight, the Apikidoist is like water pounding on a rock. He uses a barrage of techniques until he wears down his attack.
Face each other. Taekwondo, way of kicking and punching, is Korea's national sport. Some historians trace its roots to the Hwarang Warriors. Others say it was born this century during the 35-year Japanese occupation of Korea that began in 1910. Traditional Taekwondo is to teach uh, people uh, that how to coordinate their body and mind. So I believe in action philosophy, and, and Taekwondo is action philosophy. This action philosophy has only a few techniques that use blocks, strikes, and the signature spinning and jumping kicks. There's no such a thing as advanced technique. There are only a half dozen basics, maybe a dozen basics. And you only perfect these basics. And so perfect. And you can combine them with the speed and accuracy. Now that is advanced. In just over four decades, Taekwondo has become one of the world's most popular martial arts. Okinawa is the birthplace of karate, the empty hand art of self-defense that began in the 17th century. Today, karate is an international sport. I see it! Karate is no rule, no limits. You can use your whole best, depends on the situation, depends on the opponents, and depends on the time. You can use any parts of the human body. There are several styles of karate. All are characterized by blocks, kicks, strikes, and shots. Shouting is, some people misunderstand uh, while well, crazy people making sounds and uh, encouraging himself or discouraging opponents, but it's not that way. It's one of the strongest moments of your breathing, which is explosion with the sounds that we call kiai. To train, forms or kata are used which develop balance, endurance, precision and fast reflexes. Karate is always by patterns. Why? Because you have to practice all the time. Otherwise, you forget. You have to sweat. You have a little pain. And you have to push yourself. That's all about it. The martial arts will return on a &E. In the 18th and 19th centuries, peace replaced strife in Japan. Many of the samurai fighting arts then evolved into spiritually oriented systems using physical training to develop character. This became known as Budo, the martial way. One of the first Budo systems was the ancient art of Sumo. Over 2,000 years old, Sumo has its roots in Shintoism, Japan's national religion. According to legend, a great deity fought a contest with the leader of a warlike tribe over the control of power. The deity proved victorious, and the bout laid the foundation for Sumo. Later, the samurai were taught small techniques for battlefield combat. As Japan settled into a peaceful era in the 17th century, Sumo grew into a popular spectator game. Today, Sumo is Japan's national pastime and has a growing contingent of worldwide fans and participants. With both professional and amateur tournaments, Sumo is considered by many to be the most brutal of all martial arts. If you break your finger, your ears half torn off because somebody's bashed into it. Most of the rest of them have these huge cauliflower ears. You just keep going. You, you, you don't give up. 
matches are fought inside a 15-foot circular form known as a dohyo. A bout begins with bowing as a sign of respect, then clapping once to call attention to the gods and to show that the hands are empty. The hands touch the ground, the match begins. The kids got to roll, get up. Flexibility and speed are key to winning. In fact, most small victories are decided in the first seconds of the match. It's very seldom that once a person's got a great grip that somebody's able to counteract that and, and throw. And that's why the Japanese love sumo so much, because these giant, huge gentlemen or these small, incredibly fast athletes, the explosion, the impact, the, the speed is just... The amateur lightweight class starts at 187 pounds, but there's no limit in the amateur open class where wrestlers can weigh 700 pounds. In a match, the wrestlers are allowed to push, pull, slap, throw, or grab. A bout is lost when any part of the body, except for the feet, touches the mat, or when pushed outside the ring. Step down, the winner of Manuel Garbo. After the Warring States era ended in the 16th century, the sword continued to be held sacred among the samurai. The medieval art of swordsmanship, influenced by the teachings of Zen, evolved into Kendo, way of the sword. Although Kendo today is practiced as a sport, its true essence lives on. The Kendoists have an expression, Kiken Taichi, which means the spirit, the body, and the sword are one. To train and compete, one wears a keikoki, a loose-fitting jacket and divided skirt-like trousers, or hakama, which were traditionally worn by the samurai. Its primary function is to give you freedom of movement with your legs and also to kind of hide your leg and, and foot movement so your opponent really can't see when you're trying to advance on him. For protection, a five-flap tarei shields the hips and groin, a breastplate, helmet, and gloves are also worn. In place of a sword, a bamboo replica or a shin ai is used. <laughs> the object is to score points by striking eight specific target areas located on the gloves, breastplate, helmet, or by thrusting at the throat. People think that Kendo is a difficult martial art to learn because you you do have to have specific targets, you have to have proper execution. And once they start to master Kendo, they think, well, if I can do that, I can do anything. Bows have been popular in Japan since the 5th century BC when they were used in battle. But when firearms were introduced in the 16th century, Kyudo, way of the bow, became an expression of truth, goodness, and beauty, or Shinzenbi. It was always considered that if you studied Kyudo correctly and properly and diligently, you would be, you would be able to understand the five principal Confucian virtues, humanity or benevolence, sincerity, proper decorum and etiquette or propriety, wisdom, and righteousness. All of these things had to be displayed in how you shot. The Japanese bow, or yumi, measures seven feet long, the longest in the world. The object is to hit a target a foot in diameter from about 75 feet. From the very beginning, the bow was considered to be held in extremely high regard by the Japanese as an implement that had almost magical powers was considered to have the ability to, to bring peace to the realm. It was also believed that the sound of the string could chase off evil spirits. Evil spirits. Not all modern Japanese martial arts are budo systems. Historically, ninjas were spies and assassins. So, ninjutsu, art of stealth, was pragmatic and utilitarian. 
lacking formality, ninjutsu wasn't well suited for transformation to a do art. Ninpo, that's another way to say the same martial art, uh, really is this composite way of dealing with danger. The art of ninjutsu is the art of how to win against incredible, difficult odds. So therefore, these are ways to use what others would call danger to our advantage. Ninjutsu's foundation lies in the forces of nature. We have a model of what we call the four elements. There's an earth stability model. There's a water fluidity model. There's a fire a direct linear intensity model. There's a wind freedom of movement model. So as you can see, with looking at these four different options, we're teaching people to really be ready for anything, no matter what kind of situation comes up. Although there are several schools of Jujitsu, one legend claims it evolved from a ninjutsu style that emphasized bone-breaking techniques. Today, some consider Jujitsu the most effective form of self-defense. We have a solution for every imaginable situation. So it doesn't matter if it's a headlock, a bear hug, some kind of a collar grab, punch, a kick, a headlock on the ground. It doesn't matter what situation you're in. We always have an easy and effective way to escape. To train, the emphasis is placed on defending against small weapons and multiple attacks. Traditionally, the body is used as leverage against a strong attack. But in small circle jujitsu, a style founded in the 1940s by Wally J, one can gain power over an attacker simply by gaining dominance over one figure. It's called palming. And this is the dance of pain. I was trying to control a guy not to hurt him anywhere necessary. I do what you call transition from one technique to the next one. In other words, I put a hold on a person, they resist me, I just change the technique. And it's so simple, it's done with the fingers and the hands. No strength involved. I'm using his strength all the time. No. In 1882, Dr. Jigoro Kano selected the safest grappling techniques from Jiu-Jitsu to form a new Budo he called Judo. There are three maxims in Judo. Uh, the first one is self-perfection, the second one is mutual welfare and benefit, and the third one is uh, maximum efficiency with minimum effort. From the beginning, Judo was designed not only as an art, but as a sport. It became the first Asian martial art to be practiced worldwide by both men and women. And so far, it is the only martial art that is an official Olympic event. Judo's techniques are throws, pins, arm locks, and chokes. Unlike its Judo cousin, there are no competitions in Aikido. Its founder, Morihei Ueshiba, studied Jiu-Jitsu under Buddhist and Shinto priests. In 1942, he merged his religious and martial training into what some claim to be the most spiritual of all the Japanese martial arts. In Aikido, one controls an attacker by throwing him off balance using continuous circular motions that redirect an opponent's energy against himself. At the same time, Often, painful arm and wrist locks are applied. The idea is not to try to overcome the opponent, but to try to blend with his uh, power, blend with his momentum, to be able to control him or throw him or put him down with the least amount of effort. Ultimately, Aikido, like many of the Asian martial arts, isn't about winning a fight. It's about Kokoro, conquering the inner self. Martial Arts will return on A&E. Since ancient times, the combination of physical and mental discipline has been a part of the martial arts. Physical training provided warriors such as the Warang and the Samurai with fighting techniques. Mental discipline, largely based on Zen Buddhism, 
gave warriors a framework within which they could face life and death fearlessly. Such ultimate wisdom was considered enlightenment. When you move, you don't physically just move your body, you move your energy, you move, move the key. Physical strength directly connect to the mental strength. You have to have an honest um, spirit, a very straight and honest spirit, so you can listen to the teacher, absorb what you're being taught, and, and practice as, as best you can. And it is considered if you do that diligently, you will come to understand what is called Zen which means goodness, morality, or virtue. Zen looked very closely at the purpose of life and looked very close at death. So if you could face death unflinchingly, you can live your life to the fullest. Always had this duality. So a very strong point in Zen was that the study of Zen prepared one for death. The union of a legal combat system and a spiritual philosophy may seem at odds. Yet tolerance has been the strength of Buddhism for centuries. It was tolerance that led the ancient Shaolin community to accept boxing and weapons trade. Slow, deep breathing, cheap breathing, not only gave them endurance and concentration during hours of meditation, but also increased their striking power. What helped them pray also helped them fight. However, a monk who was a master of combat was bound by rules to use his skill defensively and only as a last resort. The monks were influenced by the Taoist philosophy of Lao Tzu, a scholar in 6th century BC China. In his book, The Way and Its Power, Lao Tzu writes of living in harmony with nature and understanding the balance of opposites in the universe. In Chinese, Wei is translated as Tao and refers to the natural way in which the universe flows. Natural way in the Taoist view would be the flow of a river, the fall of rain, and the coming and going of seasons. In the martial arts, if violent force is coming at you, the most difficult thing is to put a violent force against that force. You have strong, strong conflict. To move with the force, like in judo, means the, uh, the soft way is to move with the flow. So the founder of judo, they said, if you wrestled with him, it was like wrestling with an empty jacket because he was not fighting. According to Taoism, all life is composed of yin and yang. These are the two vital elements that create change, and you can find in everything from day and night, left and right, up and down, male, female, this type of duality. So if you know how to work with the duality in a natural way, you have a much better chance of, for example, having long life. The same thing with the martial traditions. If you practice in harmful ways, you may come to an early end. Tai Chi Chuan at its highest expression is a perfect balance of yin and yang. It's a boxing method based on the practice of Tai Chi or uniting the yin and the yang. It means that you're dealing with the body, the left and the right, top and the bottom, but also the inside and the outside. So to bring all of this in harmony in a martial tradition, Mixed with Taoist and Confucian elements, 
to help shape the codes of conduct for the Huarang and Samurai warriors on and off the battlefield. Through Zen training, the ancient Korean and Japanese warriors were able to achieve what the Japanese call Mushin, or empty mind. With this, a warrior was able to face his opponents with a completely clear mind, empty of all preconceived notions and emotions such as fear, doubt, guilt, and hatred. To give the warrior the courage and the mental or spiritual freedom to be able to fight without any kind of hang up or mental obstruction or fear, I think is the greatest contribution of Zen to the warrior. By the late 19th century, many Japanese and Korean martial arts would begin to add the suffix Do to their names. In Japanese, Do has the same meaning as Dao in Chinese, Wei. This move signified a desire to train not so much for self-preservation as for self-realization and to strive for spiritual perfection through physical training. I call martial art without philosophy street fight. That's simple. That's why uh, martial art can be a good, it can be evil. If you have a philosophy, it will be good. Without philosophy, just physical punching and kicking, that could be very evil. At its highest level, the harmony of mind and body is what gives contemporary martial arts masters awesome strength. As ancient warriors did centuries ago, many modern martial artists are able to develop their chi or ki, their vital internal energy, allowing them to perform incredible physical feats, yet remain unharmed. If you talk about chi as an energy, one of the old Chinese characters for this is like a vapor just uh, evaporating into the air. It's very hard to see um, vapor, but the concept of qi is also very elusive. So in the martial traditions, people talk about qi and having this energy flow through their body, but you can't see it. It is possible, though, to feel qi. A master martial artist's qi wow, awesome. is so powerful that he is able to actually transfer his energy to someone simply by touch. A burning heat sensation may result that can actually be used to heal a variety of aches and pains. Ow. Ow. The practice of developing chi is called qigong. It's a 3,000-year-old system based on breathing, balance, relaxation, and endurance exercises to form internal strength and energy. It can take years of training, of intense mental concentration, before one fully masters Qigong technique and remains uninjured in its practice. Meditation is very important because it helps us to calm down the mind. If your mind's not calm down, your chi won't grow. Hey, hey, hey. The Chinese were pioneers in channeling chi into their martial arts. Hey, hey. They were concerned very much for the power that this chi and the use of the bodily energy, focused energy, uh, would, would impart to their martial practice. When you develop all those power, for the fighting, you, know, you can use them. If somebody attack you, you can defend without, you know, using to, without hurting yourself. In Qigong, In Qigong, you have to develop all areas of the body. Because an opponent can strike anywhere and you have to be able to protect yourself. The most difficult part of this training is learning how exactly to guide one's chi where and when it's needed. <laughs> this monk has so intensely concentrated his chi in the navel area that it holds the bowl firmly in place. When the monk, in effect, disengages his chi, the bowl is released. <laughs> 
First, I moved the energy up from the area just below my navel, called the Dan Din, up, up, up to my throat. When the energy stops there, I seal it off to make it strong. There's an old Chinese saying that um, where the mind goes, the qi goes. So if you just practice and let the qi flow naturally, which is a, a strong foundation in the Asian tradition is to just move naturally, have a natural movement in your martial art. If you move well, then the, the qi flows. After years of qigong training, martial artists view these feats as proof of achieving the highest level of physical and mental discipline. Martial arts will return on A and E. We now return to the martial arts on A and E. Remember to stay focused, people. Millions of people worldwide are training in the martial arts. Inhale. Great. In the U.S. Yes, alone, yes. there are nearly five million practitioners who train for a variety of reasons. Some for simple exercise, others for self-improvement, self-defense, or sport. So are eight time Hawaii State Sumo Champion. Such diversity and popularity have helped make the martial arts a multi-million dollar industry with a conglomerate of commercial enterprises to serve martial artists. I'm certainly interested in what's the latest and the greatest in the martial arts. Video. In virtually any method of disseminating information, you're going to find martial artists heavily involved, whether it's through the internet, through city roms. The mounted position is probably one of the most dangerous positions in a fight. Through books, through magazines. It's a gigantic industry, multifaceted. That doesn't even count the entertainment industry. Martial artists sometimes find themselves at odds over the propriety of such huge money-making opportunities. Originally, martial art is not designed to make money. It's not a business. It's, it's the relationship between the teacher and student. And there's a physical and spiritual connection there. The training of the classical martial artists, or budoku, is guided by a goal of self-realization and often a not-for-profit mentality. It's a way to hand down the wisdom to the next generation and hand down the culture and hand down the technique and hand down the art to the next generation. And that has nothing to do with money and has nothing to do with profit. In contrast, the training goal of the non-traditional martial artists, Fujitsu, <laughs> is self-preservation. He or she is generally not opposed to the more commercial aspects of the martial arts as a way to promote self-defense. We have what it takes to win a fight. And I strongly believe that anybody who gets into martial arts are looking for self-defense. <laughs> With yearly grosses in the millions, the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Academy in Southern California is the most financially successful martial arts school in the U.S. <laughs> The Gracie brothers, Hoyce and Horian, and their father, Avio, offer more than jujitsu classes. Martial arts entrepreneurs, the Gracies have a mail-order business that offers instructional CD-ROMs and videos, and Gracie gear, their signature clothing line. Orion Gracie, who has been called the Bill Gates of Jiu-Jitsu after the software mogul, is a tireless promoter of the family enterprise. I believe that the reason we are so successful is because we have the best product. Put in the ground, kick, step back. There's no coincidence why we are on the top. Plus, the fact that we have always been ready to, you know, put on a challenge against any style of martial arts, make everybody respect the Gracie name very much. In 1993, Orion Gracie developed the ultimate fighting championship. 
a no hold bar competition for fighters of all disciplines. I created the Ultimate Fighting Championship with the objective of clearing the air of what works and what does not work in terms of martial arts. The objective is to use it like a laboratory. So bringing different champions from different styles of martial arts in one arena and see who would succeed. Who will reign tonight in UFC 4, Revenge of the Warriors? Through the late 1990s, Hoyt Gracie, Orion's younger brother, was the UFC's undefeated champion with three consecutive wins and one draw. Gracie has been censored by a number of martial artists for his participation in the often bloody bouts of the UFC. Yet, his system of self-defense allowed him to neutralize and control his opponents without serious injury to either party. There it is. He's tapping out. That's it. Beautiful technique by Gracie. Yes, sir. The ultimate fighting champion has become television's most popular pay-per-view martial arts sports event. What a performance by Gracie! However, many traditional martial artists don't participate in competition. Those who do often focus on form and on personal achievement. With sports enthusiasts, however, competitions are a means of sharpening skills and improving discipline to overcome adversity. They are an exciting physical manifestation of the knowledge and the wisdom that we have as martial artists. I think they're very, very important. They teach us sportsmanship, to be competitive. They teach us to accept a loss, to win with grace, with class, which has always been the American way. Thousands of martial arts tournaments are held every year. When you're competing, you are definitely living on the edge. People are throwing punches and kicks at you and you're throwing punches and kicks back at them. So yeah, there's an adrenaline rush. <laughs> Some of the better known karate athletes will compete in as many as 25 or 30 tournaments a year. Even the kids will do that. Parents uh, we've seen uh, take their children to as many as 30, 40 tournaments in a year. Promoter Joe Corley's karate tournament, the Battle of Atlanta, began in 1970. Over the years, the tournament has grown in size and popularity. In the early days, we competed in a college gymnasium that had six rings in it, and this year we're in 46 rings. We had 250 competitors then, and this year we've got about 2,900 competitors. Today, a good 60% of those 2,900 competitors are under 17 years old. And that really speaks to the future of the sport. widespread presence of martial arts in the movies and on television has had a great impact on the growth of the martial arts industry. Martial arts movies have cut a permanent place in the art of the fight scene, and the genre has now spread into every type of picture. Children's, drama, comedy, and action. You look at the, the bigger budget movies today, they all use martial arts. They all have stunt coordinators, they all have fight coordinators that teach them martial arts. So, I mean, it developed into a tremendous industry. Action! <laughs> and back up! Right side, break ball! Action! And back up! Face your partner! At the action filmmaking camp near Boston, Massachusetts, <laughs> Students learn proper martial arts stunt techniques. Dynamite! We decided we need to start training some people for use in the movies. We can find talent that can be the stars, but to find the people that can get hit around by the stars that make the stars look good is difficult. Action! Looking good, guys! We can hire martial artists, but they don't fight for the screen necessarily. They might be the best kickers and punchers that you know, but they have to 
fight in a certain way to make the, the actor look good. In this business, you don't want to hit the main actor ever. Ready? Students learn the difference between performing martial arts in movies. This is the kind of motion I would do on the street. I would be doing this. And training in the martial arts. It's the future right here. Martial arts techniques might be snappy and powerful, where we need a flowing, linear movement, which is foreign to a lot of martial arts. In fact, I've had martial arts on the set say, I never throw a technique that way. <coughs> you want it to look good. And martial artists get worried about their reputation and they want to do it the only the way they do it. A traditional martial artist might say, well, that's not good martial arts. But I would then say in return, good martial arts isn't going to look good on the camera. Commercial ventures in the martial arts aren't limited to the West, of course. Once remote and mysterious, the Shaolin Temple, home to China's ancient fighting monks, is now visited by over one million tourists a year. I think in the effort to make it popular and to make it accessible and for many people to make lots of money, I think we've compromised lots of things in the martial arts that we shouldn't have. But others applaud the martial arts popularization believing it results in new students and industry growth. By Americanizing it, we've really said, listen, this is something you can do. No, you don't have to move in their own monastery. We don't have to have you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can get two, three, four hours a week and really benefit in your life from this. And when an American hears that they can do that, then they're more attracted to it. The martial arts will return on a and &E. We now return to the martial arts on a and &E. For many, the martial arts are not about hiding. They're about living. Studying martial arts is often a life-changing journey in which students find courage and develop discipline in facing obstacles or adversity. The martial arts promote belief in oneself because as physical skill is acquired, self-confidence is gained. Never fight to achieve selfish ends, but to develop fight for right. With continued practice, oh, all right, a girl. that confidence is manifested in everything the student does. So it's not surprising that there are hundreds of success stories in the martial arts involving some truly extraordinary people, adults as well as children. <laughs> Willie the Bam Johnson had been headed down a dangerous path. Through the martial arts, he would be shown a better way and find his life's work. Bam grew up in a tough Baltimore neighborhood where positive role models were few and far between. It was a common thing, someone dying or gunshots or an ambulance just passing by. I mean, it was, it was really bad. But one day, he caught a glimpse of a better life. A Bruce Lee movie was playing at what used to be this local theater. To six-year-old Willie, Bruce Lee represented the possibility of a future outside the neighborhood projects. After leaving that movie theater, I knew in my heart and in my mind that I was going to be something bigger and better than a drug dealer or a, a street hustler or a gang member. So I began to practice and imitate all those different movements that I seen him demonstrating on the screen, which led to trying to demonstrate those movements that I seen in books and magazines. But emulating Bruce Lee proved difficult. Like many of his friends, Johnson became involved with illegal activities. I was responsible for the violence that began to occur in our community. Um, I was a part of that foundation that was being laid for my generation. At age 23, he paid the price for his actions with a prison sentence. It was a turning point. Forced to take a hard look at what he had become, 
Johnson realized he could summon inner strength to shape his own life. That's what martial arts is all about. It's about standing up humbly and saying that I choose not to live this way anymore. I choose to live this way. I'm not at conflict. I'm not in conflict with you. I just refuse to cooperate with this manner of behavior. Willie Johnson threw himself back into martial arts training when he was released from prison. He began entering and winning martial arts tournaments. Six times he was named world champion in Kung Fu and sports karate. The band was born. Illegal weapon use. Illegal weapon use. In 1994, Johnson was chosen for a starring role on WMAC Masters a television program that presents martial artists as role models. Hey, Bam. Sorry about using my staff out there. Uh, it was a reflex action. It won't happen again. No problem, Turbo. It definitely made our match more interesting. Far from his old neighborhood, the band has opened a martial arts school where he teaches more than mere physical expertise. All right, give me 25 good jumping jacks. Are we ready? Yeah. All right, let's rock and roll. Begin! Come on, let's go! A lot of times people talk about Bam as being a world champion, and I like to characterize him as a world-class individual. That's really important in the martial arts, to have someone that sets that kind of example so that you can have something to really strive for and to continuously be challenged. Okay, come on, Mr. Marco. Rock and roll, go, come on. The band had begun instructing his son, Marco, in martial arts at a young age. Let's work, let's work. And now Marco helps his father teach. It was important for me to get my son involved in the martial arts for the sole purpose of making sure he does not make the same mistakes that I made. Marco Johnson appears with his father on the WMAC Masters TV program. Together, they stress to the viewers the importance of solid family life. The principles of martial arts show me how to become a better parent. Show me how to become a better friend. Woo -doo, woo -doo. Ah. A better human being. There's no me without martial arts. All right, thank you. Martial arts instructor holds a very important position of influence with his students. He symbolizes to them an ideal they can hardly find elsewhere. A living example for the levels of personal success that students can achieve. Jun Ri is known as the father of American Taekwondo. When he moved from South Korea to the United States in 1956 to teach, Few people had ever heard of Taekwondo. I said that when I come to U.S., I'm going to really uh, enhance the image of Taekwondo by introducing philosophy and discipline and, and, and emphasizing academic excellence for children. Jun Ri went on to teach children and adults in the United States. He's on a mission to tell no less than the entire world about the physical benefits of martial arts training. In 1965, when a congressman was mugged in Washington, Jun Ri decided that the inhabitants of Capitol Hill could benefit from the advantages of martial arts training. He has been instructing America's congressmen in Taekwondo ever since. Face the instructor. 
I get benefit because they tell the whole country how wonderful the Taekwondo is. Now they get benefit because they get exercised and, and, and healthy. Uh, they get rid of the stress uh, they have in, in, in daily work. So I have been teaching uh, 32 years now, three mornings in, in, in a week, uh, rain or shine, as long as they are in session. I just think that, that he's a truly unique person who, uh, who really does live by the standards uh, that he preaches. Junri starts every day with 1,000 push-ups and other exercises that keep him strong and flexible. Sometimes I put a glass of water on my head and play harmonica. I'm 65 and a half, and uh, I feel like 18 right now, and I like to maintain and when I'm 100 years uh, of age, uh, and I like to feel like 18. So my motto is 100 years of wisdom in a body of 18. Exercise is very important, and martial arts uh, accomplishes two goals. One is uh, physical discipline, and the other is mental discipline. It's good for uh, people that don't otherwise get a lot of exercise. A lot of people think I really uh, did so much for their lives, and uh, when they tell me what I have done for them, that really makes me very happy. Martial arts are avenues through which students can reach heights of personal achievement they never dreamed possible. Okay, you ready to go there, kiddo? We're gonna do a little karate tonight? Huh? Yep. Yep, you ready to go? When Amber was born in a small Minnesota town, the doctors told her parents she wouldn't do much more than lie there. They said she was born with severe hydrocephalus, which is the fluid on the brain. Um, they didn't expect her to survive. They didn't give us a lot of hope at the time. It was pretty hard. The doctors were wrong. Amber is a survivor. While the eight-year-old copes with mild retardation, and a host of other ills. I got the right to go. <laughs> her parents wanted to find an activity she could do with her two sisters, Shannon and Becky. Let's go back. Let's go back. There you go. When Shannon began studying Taekwondo, Amber's father knew they had found just the thing for Amber. There you go. When I saw her, when I was on the sideline having so much fun, then I joined. And then Becky and Amber saw everybody else in it. She wanted to be in it, too. Take your time. So it's going to be one, two. At first, Amber's instructors worried about her safety. With Amber, probably our biggest concern when she first came in was to have her do something which she shouldn't be doing because of some of the disabilities she has. And that's where it was real helpful for Jim, because Jim's always out there. Amber's father is with her every step of the way in class. In spite of her disabilities, Amber has earned a yellow belt, a beginner's first ranking in Taekwondo. She's a fighter, and it was just such a neat, neat deal. She proved to a lot of people that, you know, in the heart is where it's at. One of the luxuries I think we have when it comes to the lower belts is we base a lot of the criteria on attitude and on effort and how willing they are to put themselves into it. And Amber in a lot of ways exceeded a lot of the other kids with, with the effort she puts in. Good job! <laughs> I can see Amber getting another belt maybe, but with Amber I don't think that's really her goal is to get the belts. It's the journey into getting there that really counts. Much in the martial arts has changed over thousands of years. Time-honored traditions remain. From the ancient era of Bodhidharma through the decades of the modern masters. The martial arts, at their most impressive, have always been about instilling courage, 
self-confidence, heart. The martial arts are increasingly becoming a part of everyday living. Their benefits limited only by the infinite power of the mind. a and special presentation of the martial arts is now available on home video. Call 1-800-423-1212 and for $29.95 plus shipping and handling, receive the martial arts. Now meet the master of Kung Fu whose mysterious death shocked the world, Bruce Lee, on a special presentation of Biography, next on A&E.